We're going to do a little question and answer session. I'm going to create the difference bowling store number three. And uh, we're going to talk about some cracks. Let me see if I can flip this bad boy around. Flip this around real quick. Look all right over there? Yeah, all right. So what I want to show y'all is, what's going on, Matt? I want to show you this bowling ball that's cracking. This is kind of important because you're going to be able to watch this bowling ball crack live on Facebook. We're going to kind of do it together. So what I've been doing is I've been marking where it's been cracking every like basically 20 or 30 minutes. So right now, as you can see, the crack is right here. So we're going to mark that spot. But you watch, by the end of this live video, you can see it ain't cracked past it yet. But you watch, by the end of this live video, that crack's going to move. And I want to talk about cracking specifically. What's going on, Steve? Um, I want to talk about cracking specifically because a lot of people have asked, you know, bowling balls crack. I got bowling balls sitting on my rack. They crack. Why do they crack? What's going on? So I want to talk a little bit about it. Now, this bowling ball, we kind of actually, oh, look at this. We got another crack going on. We actually kind of set this bowling ball up to be able to crack. I wanted y'all to be able to see it. This is brand new. We didn't, we didn't have that one marked. Let me clean it off real quick so we can, you know, we clean it off with that purple stuff. Let's go ahead and clean that part off and then we'll, we'll mark where that crack's at too. That's, that's actually a new crack. We, I actually wanted to set it up so you guys could be able to watch a bowling ball crack. So go ahead and mark that too. My man Abe's in here checking me out. You can see this mark right there. It's not cracked past that mark. So we actually have two cracks coming on. But I wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about cracking and why and what happened. So as you can see when a ball cracks, it actually cracks all the way to the core, right? Like the whole shell is cracked all the way to the core. Now, here's part of the reason why that happens. Part of the reason that happens is because the density of this material is different than the density of this material. So think of it as two different materials um, interacting with each other. And as a result of that, when they get hot, when they get cold, when they're exposed to sharp edges, they expand and contract at different rates. That's what starts the cracking process. And when you drill a bowling, when you drill a hole in a bowling ball, you make it real easy for these two materials to start to propagate or spread a crack. So that's why this bowling ball, as you're gonna watch, I mean, you're gonna watch it happen within our little live stream here. You're gonna watch this ball get worse on this spot right here, as well as that spot right there. And you can see it's already starting to go down there. It's already starting to get worse. That's so funny. So anyway, when the manufacturer makes the bowling ball, and it doesn't matter what manufacturer, this, this happens to be a DVA ball, but it doesn't matter what manufacturer, they all do the same thing. So when they make a ball, this material, which is the pen you can see, actually has multiple components of plastic intertwined in the, in the manufacturing process. So all of this has different abilities to uh, expand and contract. So that's why when you drill a hole by the pen, it makes it even more prone to crack. And a lot of cracks start from the pin area because this material is different than this material, is different than this plastic piece, is different than this plastic piece. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of why the different materials are what causes a lot of the cracking. And the actual sharp edge just makes that crack more prone uh, to be able to happen. When a bowling ball is made, they actually start out really big and they get smaller. So like, um, a bowling ball is oversized, and as they cure, as they get hard, as they come to a solid material because it comes out as a liquid, it actually gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That smaller provides compression of the shell on the core, but the core doesn't get any smaller, right? The core is already made, the core is formed, it's done. So basically you're pouring a liquid bowling ball material over the bowl. And you know what? You know what? We can prove this. I got my man Abe here. Look, you know what? I'm going to kind of prove it to you guys. So essentially what I'm telling you is it's kind of like this. We're going to, we're going to plug this ball up and we'll, we'll kind of be able to prove it that way. So I'm going to kind of prove to you what I'm saying. Um, we're going to actually, we're going to make some ball plug. Ball plug is, is a similar type of material. It isn't exactly the same as the bowling ball material, but it is a very, very similar material. So what we're going to do is... We're going to plug up this ball so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. That's a really big spot to plug, though, and that's only going to get worse. So let's do it in a different ball. We'll do it in this ball here. 
Yeah. Well, we, we, we're, we're going to use this one anyway, okay, though. Cool. So let's do this. So let's let's clean these holes out, clean the holes out, and then make the edge sharp here, and then we'll plug it up. Then when we plug it up, we'll actually plug it to the rim so we can show that the material is actually going to grow, which creates, um, in this case, uh, the material will expand, which when you're making the ball, it expands and then it contracts. So that's what that's what's going to create the issue that we're going to have over here. So we're gonna I'm gonna have him work on that for a little bit while we talk some more about what's going on. So look, first off, you can already see. In this little bit of time, our crack is propagated, our crack is spreaded. So you can see the crack when we first started this live video was right here, and now it's already past it. Let me go ahead and mark that spot. Therefore, we got some more, you know, more proof. So we're gonna go mark it. Right here. That's the end of the crack. You can see, right? There's no more crack there. But watch, it's gonna end up being there. So, and what's gonna happen to this ball? It's gonna go all the way around. See how wide the gap is up here and how small the gap is? That's because literally this ball is going to get wider here and continue to just spread that crack all the way around the ball. Now, the real question is, and look over here. Look over here already. Boom, look at that. Already, that crack's propagated too. So you can see how quickly these cracks are actually moving. This ball is going to spread pretty fast. Once again, the edge of the crack is like right here. You can see that. Watch, it's going to crack. What's going on, D? So... What is happening is the ball has found a weak spot. The cover's found a weak spot to be able to release this compression pressure that it has, right? So the, the ball starts out like this. It grows when it's made, and then it starts to compress back. When it compresses back, it holds that, basically, until it can find some way to escape. Most of the time, it can't escape. Um, just, it just can't, so then it doesn't crack, and your ball's fine. But when you start putting sharp holes in bowling balls, that's when you can actually have the cracking begin. And as a result, which is what we did here, we've actually started that process, and now the process is going to go all the way around the ball. The ball is going to continue to crack until it can release all of that pressure. You'd be amazed at how big this will get. It'll actually tear away, the cover stock will actually tear away from the core um, when it's fully done. This will actually be separate from each other. You can see over here too. Sometimes it'll also take a piece of it with it. So like if the core is really bonded well to the cover, it'll actually take the cover with it. So in this case here, as you can see, now the core is cracked. On this side, just the cover is cracked. The core hasn't cracked yet. Sometimes it will pull the core with it. Sometimes it won't. You said you should do marks, number marks from the live stream. Oh yeah, we could do that. So, so that was one right here, right? And then this is number two right here, right? That's a good idea, Paul. That's number two. But look, I mean, you can already see it's going through. It's already going through that spot. So it's going to be it's going to be up to three real quick. So, so that's what happens. Like th that's the that's the process of what happens and what makes your bowling ball crack. Now, what you can do about it, things you can do about it. So we know that heat and cold, extreme temperature changes are really bad. Grab some gloves, and we'll start. We'll make some ball plug. Heat. And temperature changes are bad. Why is heat bad? Why is cold bad? Why are temperature changes bad? Because the expansion rate of this material is different than this material. And the more difference you have with how they expand, the more prone you are to have it crack. So as an example, if I really wanted to speed this up, I could go take this bowling ball and put it in something really hot or put it outside, get it really warm, and that would expand this material very quickly. As soon as that begins to expand, it's going to pull on this material because this material is not going to get hot as fast. They're going to begin to want to separate, and it's going to make the crack go even worse. We're not going to do that. Um, I didn't bring a hairdryer. If I had a hairdryer, we could do it with the hairdryer, and we could actually watch it get even bigger. But the point is, it's going to expand. So let's see. If you don't do anything to it, once it starts the process, it will continue until it can completely release all the pressure. And all the pressure means all the way around the ball. So believe it or not, bowling balls are like sponges. Um... So they're like compressed sponges. So once it gets a spot to start to crack, it'll just keep going all the way around the ball. So this one over here, let's check this one out real quick. Yeah, you can use those. Just use those and put equal measurements in there. You can see on this one too, it's already past the crack. And this is where we started. So this right here was number one, and this was number two. Oh, I just broke my, look, I just cracked my pencil. Don't worry, we got another one. So this is number two. And you can see it's already past that. So in the little bit of time that we've been live, you can literally watch this ball 
crack. Go ahead and put, um, yeah, put that in this side and then this in this side. Yeah, uh, see if we can clean it out first. So, Abe's over here getting the, the ball plug ready. We're going to plug a bowling ball up, sort of, so you can at least see what's going on. I kind of want you to, to experience uh, what a bowling ball is being made, what the process looks like. So, ultimately, this is, that's the, I mean, this is what happens. And this crack will continue to get wider as the pressure begins to get more and more released from the ball. And as it gets wider, it'll just keep spreading it, spreading it, spreading it. You can see it's already past our little spot. Please, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in here. The reason why I wanted to show you this or get started with this was I thought it was very topical. Um, but this is more of a Q&A session for you guys. So if you have questions, please feel free to just start asking them here and we'll get them answered as quickly as possible. So that explains why bowling balls crack. How do you stop them from cracking? One thing you can do is you can go to your pro shop and go ask them for this, the plastic bag that the ball comes in. Now, the reason why the manufacturer puts the plastic bag in the box in the first place is to stop the ball from rubbing around on the box and getting kind of scuffed up. That's what the plastic bag is in the box for in the first place. But this plastic bag does two things for you, especially if you've got a drilled bowling ball. I told you bowling balls crack for, uh, they, they try, crack because they're sponges, right? So it's a, it's a hard sponge that's been compressed. And as it begins to release that compression, if it gets a spot where it can release that, it causes the crack. So here is one thing that you can do. The bowling ball has a liquid in it. The liquid is called plasticizer. And as a matter of fact, I may be able to get you to see plasticizer in a bowling ball. Let me get a, do we have a flathead screwdriver somewhere? So I'm going to show you the plasticizer in a bowling ball. Now let me just grab one of my new bowling balls up here. Let's, uh, let's grab, uh, let's do the IQ because it's, because it's dark. You'll be able to see it a little bit easier that way. So. Bowling balls, when they're manufactured, they're manufactured with a liquid. The liquid's called plasticizer. Plasticizer helps create the pores in the bowling ball that ultimately turn into the ball's ability to absorb oil, okay? So they put a liquid in the bowling ball. That liquid then boils itself out. Once it boils itself out, it leaves a cavity. That cavity is a, is a hole. That hole can then absorb oil. That's what happens. So check this out. Let's see, can the drill? Yeah. Good question, right now. So his question is, can the drill bits that the pro shop operator use cause this to happen? Absolutely. Dull drill bits will cause a lot of compression. A lot of more, a lot more compression creates more, uh, more of the ability for the ball to be able to crack. So having really sharp drill bits allows it to cut easier, allows it to cut cleaner, and that can actually help with stopping that from happening. Doesn't doesn't guarantee it's not going to happen, but it can definitely help. So that's a great idea, Steve. You give a bag to every customer that buys a ball from you. That's a really good idea. I'm gonna show you, if you kind of press on the ball, which I'm, I'm pressing with my finger, with my thumb. See that? See that? That's plasticizer. So this is, this is a brand new ball. There's, this is a brand new ball, there's nothing going on. But there's plasticizer in this ball. So when I put this flathead screwdriver on here and I press on the ball, I am compressing the ball, which will make that plasticizer come to the surface. So watch, since I remove the screwdriver, it's wet. And then see it go dry again? So that's the, that's the liquid material that they put into the bowling ball when it's manufactured. Here's the key. Why does that do anything with the bag? Here's why it matters with the bag. If you put your ball back in the bag, you're less likely for this material to evaporate out by itself. So remember leaving the ball in the hot sun, uh, the ball gets warm, that allows this plasticizer to come out of the ball. As that comes out of the ball, the ball is going to begin to get dry. As the ball gets dry, it'll become brittle. As it becomes brittle, guess what it's more prone to do? Crack. So one of the keys to help keeping your bowling ball from dying and cracking is putting the bowling ball back in the plastic bag. Now, if we're going to put it in the plastic bag, we want to conserve the plasticizer that's in the ball like I just showed you. So like I said, brand new ball, it's dry. When you press on it, you can, you can actually get the plasticizer to come up to the surface. There's a plasticizer, and you'll watch it go back in the ball, slowly but surely. And you can see, I mean, it's, it's, you can see, there's no doubt that's a liquid there. You can see it's a liquid, not like I scratched the ball, right? 
liquid. So you want to keep that in your ball, basically, if you're going to help it not be prone to break. Now, with that being said, I'm going to have Abe hold this for a second. We're going to, oh, hang on. No, 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 you're good. You're good. He's actually doing the plug thing still. What I'm gonna, I'll just go ahead and do it myself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the ball back in a plastic bag, and I'm going to show you the right way to do it. Yeah. So you put it in a plastic bag, right? Then what you want to do is you want to, yeah, I'm going to have you go ahead. You can do it with the gloves on. Hold the bag. Hold the bag. So he's going to take the bag. He's going to, uh, yep, bunch it up like that and then spin it around. Spin it around. Yep, just like that. Now, now fold this over. Yep, just like that. And then we're going to set it down that way. Just like that. Perfect. So that's how you would want to store your bowling ball. If you're going to store your bowling ball for some time, you want to try to keep the moisture that's in the ball in the bag for as long as possible. That will help. That doesn't actually, that won't guarantee it won't crack, but this will definitely help. Great question, Dylan. When you use a detox, you actually remove plasticizer as well as the oil. We have a detox. Um, we actually have a different material besides water in ours, but we'll get to that later. So when you put your ball in a detox, you are removing oil, you are removing plasticizer. One of the benefits of the detox is that it, by removing that oil out of your ball, that actually helps you because the oil um, fills up those pores. Those pores, once they get full, the ball can no longer um, absorb the oil. Your ball loses performance, right? So that's the benefit of the detox. But you say, hey, well, then does that dry it out? Well, here's the thing. It puts whatever material that you have in this case or in most cases with the detox, it's water or a waterish solution. It puts that back in the ball to keep the ball moist. So in theory, in theory, you're taking out plasticizer, drying the ball up, but you're moisturizing the ball back by putting water in it. That's essentially what you're doing. We actually use a different material in our detox um, called hook juice, and it actually is specifically designed to swap out plasticizer for a much more uh, tacky material that is actually better for your ball and also improves your performance. We've got some videos on our website. We can post a link to that later, but we've got some videos on our website that actually show um, that exact thing happening where you take a brand new ball, put it in the detox with hook juice, uh, take your bowling ball out, and your ball performs about five more boards than it did when it was brand new uh, before you put it in the detox. Anyway, so it's, it's kind of a crazy thing. Now, here's the other thing that's kind of interesting. So this is a urethane ball. This is an old uh, natural. We also got a brand new uh, hot cell in, right? So hot cell is urethane. Urethane, the difference between urethane and reactive is that urethane doesn't have plasticizer in it. So if I was to go grab the plat, so watch this, we'll, we'll, we'll just do it. Go grab the hot cell, we'll grab the hot cell real quick, watch this. So if I grab the hot cell, and we do our little, our little trick over here, right? There's no plasticizer. I'm pressing, but there's no, there's no liquid there. And there won't be because there's no plasticizer in this bowl. The difference between a urethane bowl and a reactive bowl is that material. It's plasticizer. So that's also why urethane balls, for the most part, don't crack. If you think back, if people that you guys are on here that are old enough to remember, we never had a cracking issue with urethane balls back in the 80s, back in the late, early 90s. There was never a cracking issue because they don't have that same liquid evaporating out of the ball that these do. Once we got in the 90s and reactive balls became popular in the 2000s, 90s and 2000s, that's when we started seeing a lot of cracking. And that's because of plasticizer. So that's what causes, not all of it, but that's what causes a lot of the issue. This ball will not leach out plasticizer because it doesn't have it in it. That's also why urethane balls don't perform like reactive balls. That's why urethane balls are smoother. That's why urethane balls are more rounded. That's why you can sand urethane balls to a much more aggressive degree than you can a reactive ball. That's why those things happen. Um, so in the end, uh, if, you, if you want a ball that's going to last you a long time, then, I mean, urethane balls. And I've still got some old... Um, 80s urethane balls that are completely fine and they won't crack because uh, they don't have plasticizer in them. Greg, let's see what you got, Marlo. He says, so putting a ball in a ball oven or a Jayhawk is not beneficial to overall maintenance, especially just to keep it clean. So here's the thing. It's a double-edged sword. You put your ball in a ball oven, you are going to leach out plasticizer, which means you are going to potentially accelerate the ball's ability to crack. Now, I'm not saying that that's guaranteed to make it crack, but what I'm telling you is that Plasticizer in your bowling ball, in a reactive bowling ball, and not drying your bowling ball out will help the ball last longer 
over time. Unfortunately, at some point, the plastic notch is going to leach out anyway. Over time, it's going to come out anyway. It just, it just typically turns out to be such a long period of time, nobody cares. Um, but if you start putting your ball in the oven, you are, you're going to heat the surface, right? You're going to heat the surface faster than you're going to heat the core, which is going to create a pressure differential between the two, which is going to make it more prone to crack. That's just, that's just a fact. It doesn't matter what level of heat you use. It's going to make it more prone to crack. Now look, here we go. Look at this. So now we're up to mark number three, right? So we did mark number one right here. It was here. Then we did mark number two. And now we're ready for, you want to mark it? We're ready for mark number three. Oh, actually a little bit lower than that. Hang on, let me wipe that off. Yeah, I think it's let's right go here. right below. Yeah, right below it. Yep, right there. That's mark number three. So literally, in the time that we've spent talking, the ball has the crack has propagated at least three times. Now let's go to the other one. Yeah, number that one's moved too. You can see it's moved a lot. So you can just, I mean, you can see what's going on here. So, it, I mean, it's a bad deal, bad deal. So the question is, can hook juice prevent cracking? So there's, so can hook juice prevent cracking? It can help aid in stopping the ball from cracking for sure. Can it prevent cracking? No, because there's still other factors that, that prevent, that can be culprits for cracking, right? So an example, the sharp edge creates propagation potential for cracking. So, I mean, look at it this way, right? So the fact that this edge is sharp, if I was to take my little screwdriver and I was to hit this with a hammer, guess where it would crack at? Right there immediately. Why? Because it's a hard edge for a crack to be able to propagate on. If I did the exact same thing, but I did it here, it's less likely to crack because there's no hard edge for the crack to start from and then start propagating. So it won't necessarily prevent, completely prevent cracking because you, you really can't do that as soon as you start drilling holes in bowling balls, you, you make other areas prone for them to crack. But could soaking a ball, could putting a ball, could having a ball in hook juice help extend the life of a bowling ball because you're replacing the plasticizer with a material that, that is less likely to uh, dry out over time? Absolutely, absolutely. So I just kind of want to drop that knowledge on you guys, man. Yeah, I know, right? I, I thought that was pretty cool too. I wanted people to be able to see the cracking uh, and how it actually happens. And you can look, I mean, look, it's already moved past our little spot already. Look at that. It's our, now it's down here. Now it's right there from when we just did it like, I mean, what, two minutes ago? And literally it's going to get worse. And you can look up here, you can see how wide the crack is. I mean, it's huge up here and it's just getting, it gets smaller, smaller, smaller because the crack starts small. And then as this, as this continues to, to propagate and spread, it's just going to keep cracking. And before it's over, it's going all the way around to another spot where it can finish releasing the pressure. Which, guess what? The other spot's probably going to end up somewhere over here by the pin, or it's going to end up over here because the crack already started from over here, too. But it's going to end up releasing itself. That's kind of how that process works. So, yeah, so put your ball in a bag, man. Um, the bag does another thing, too. So the bag also, uh, here's another, another way to create to help stop your ball from cracking as much. If you set your ball on a material like wood that's porous, the plasticizer can actually go from the ball to the wood. And that's why they crack more on wood. And that's why they crack more on wood, exactly. That's why they crack more on wood. So like, here's an example. We have a wood rack over here, right? So leaving the ball on the wood over a long period of time is a very bad deal because this is absorbent, this is porous, Plasticizer can leach out of here into this material, which makes it dry. Once it dries out, guess what? It's more prone to crack. All right, let's answer some more questions. So Darren says, can you create a rejuvenator out of a bucket of hot water and hook juice in a five gallon bucket? So Darren, the answer to that question is yeah. What we do, we actually have um, a home version of hook juice, so to speak. Uh, we actually do that and that's exactly what it is. It's it's a home version. You basically pour 16 ounces, you mix it with a gallon and a half of hot water and let it sit. And then you dispose of it. And that's exactly what it does. It will go in, it'll go into your bowl, um, remove the plasticizer, swap it out for a material that's more, that's more tacky, more aggressive for their bowling ball. And it fills that void left by the ball being dried out. So, I mean, the answer to your question is, yeah, you can do that. So D says, can you use any type of plastic bag or does that have to be the one that comes? It doesn't matter. You can use a trash bag if you want. You just want something that's solid. So this one actually is not really the best plastic bag because there's a hole in it because you can see the hole in the bag, right? 
so that you can see the hole in the back. So this isn't really the best plastic bag. And remember I told you, what you really want to do is you want to seal it up. Like you don't want to have the hole because the hole leaves a spot for the, for the plastic to vaporize out of. So you really don't want to do that either. Um, you really want a plastic bag that's, that's solid. You can use a trash bag. You can use, I mean, I guess if they made a Gladlock bag big enough, you could probably use that too. But you want something to, to keep the ball sealed so that the plasticizer doesn't want to leach out. Great question. Let me see what else we got. Derek says, hey, Ron, I, bu I just bought a ball spinner for my home. Any tips and secrets you can share on ball maintenance? How often do you do a ball recommending special products? Yeah, Derek, we definitely can touch on that. Um, so, Darren, back to your other question. Uh, you can get one use. That's a one-use thing. Because if you start doing more than one ball out of that, uh, you can start to introduce other materials, the dirt, the oil, that's from the first batch into the second batch, and you don't want to do that. So let's talk about the spinner stuff for a quick second. So our spinner is very dirty because our spinner is heavily used. Um, what I would tell you from a spinner standpoint is a couple of things. Let me show you what I would recommend. Let's get, where's that ball you had? Your ball, your ball, because we can play with that ball. So let me show you some tips. Oh, and since you just bought a spinner on what you can do, right? Let me see here. Chad, my man, Chad. So check it out. So first off, Shout out to Chad because Chad is one of my he's one of my he's one of my new favorite people. The reason being is because Chad Chad he does a lot of educational stuff himself. Um, he works for Storm, so he he does a lot of educational videos and he does try to help uh, help promote bowling as well. So thank you, Chad, for jumping on here. Do you see any correlation between glue inserts and finger sticks and ball cracking? Absolutely, and I'm going to tell you why, Chad. And then we're going to go back to the, we'll go back to the spinner question. Let me tell you why though. So check this out. So. It's going to be hard to see, and it won't happen fast enough, but here's what happens, right? So the average person, the average pro shop, what they do is they take and they put a drop of glue. Or they put a drop of glue on the ball, right? Now, here's the thing. The way super glue works, which is actually called uh, cyoacrylate, cyoacrylate, what it does is it's going to bond two things. It doesn't bond to itself. That's why it's not going to dry out really fast here. But I'm going to kind of, we're going to kind of accelerate this a little bit. Um, yeah, let's use that. Let's use that. So we're going to spread this around a little bit. But there is a there is a correlation, and I'm going to tell you why there's a correlation. So what happens is, is once this stuff dries, what it does is it will immediately zap all of the plasticizer in that area out of that area. So, so basically. The way it cures and the fact that the bowling ball is porous, this material, the super glue, will actually go into the cover stock and freeze every, not freeze, but, but um, solidify everything. So now you have immediately made this area brittle. This area immediately becomes more brittle because the, pla the super glue has actually went into the cover stock. And you can kind of see, if I, where's your light at, Abe? You can kind of see, yeah, he's gonna get his flashlight here. You can kind of see that the, see the reflection? When this dries, once this dries, it's gonna, when once this dries, we'll be, I'll be able to show you, but this actually is going to dry out that area of the ball. And by drying it out, now it's more prone to crack. Then to double the cracking potential, you did it right by a non-beveled hole. So now you have this area of the ball right here that is really set up to make the ball crack. So that's why you see a lot of cracking by finger holes. So that's where you get the hairline cracks? That's where you get the hairline cracks from. Not always, but that's where a, that's where a lot of them can come from. So super glue can definitely cause you some issues um, when it comes to helping to propagate or helping to create cracks. Great question. How important is beveling the holes, mainly fingers related to cracking? Yep, absolutely, we just answered that question too. So essentially, the sharper the edge you have, the sharper the edge, the more prone it is to crack. What you really want to do is you want to bevel these holes and you want to round them out. Now, here's why, though. This may not be what you would think. The main reason you want to bevel the hole is because when it's sharp like this, and let's say a blunt object like a pen goes and hits that corner, that sharp edge, guess what? It makes it prone to crack. So if the hole is beveled, smoothed out, you're more likely to spread the impact over a larger area as opposed to it finally being concentrated on just the edge. So yeah, so that's why you wanna bevel the holes. I'll tell you another little trick that you can do. 
we're, I'm sorry we're bouncing around here. We got lots of questions. I want to make sure we get as many of them as, as we can taken care of. I'm going to stop on this for a second on the ball spinner and switch back because I'm going to show you one more thing you can do to help prevent cracking. And this is for pro shops, actually. This is a pro shop trick. So go ahead and set the ball right there if you don't mind. So here's the thing, right? Uh, pretend the ball's, you know what? Yeah, pretend the ball's got grips, right? So this ball doesn't have grips, but it doesn't matter. Let's pretend it does have grips. If you have a pin, right, and the pin hits right here, that's gonna make it more prone to crack. So, here you go, Abe, I'm gonna have you hold my phone. So watch this. This is something that you can do if you're a pro shop, you need to talk to your consumer first, make sure that they're okay with it. But what I would recommend that you would do is you could actually, watch this, lightly, sand that area. Now, I took just a little bit off, just right there. Now, you say, well, why would you do that? So. If this was a customer's ball, we would now, you know, sand the whole ball and get this out so that you can't tell that it's there. At least you, you could feel it, but you couldn't see it. And you can see when I just, that helps a little bit, but we would sand the ball and make it disappear. Now, why did I do that? So the reason why I did that is because now this is no longer a high spot on the ball. So if a pin was to hit this spot, it isn't gonna actually hit the bridge. It's gonna hit around the bridge, which guess what? There's more material here. There's more places for the, for the, for the impact to propagate around, and it doesn't put a whole lot of pressure right here on this bridge. So that's one little bitty trick you can use um, on your personal product is you can just, just a little bit, just to knock it off um, so that it's not so high as the rest of the ball so that when a pin does impact that area, it doesn't really hit that spot, which is a good spot for a crack to be able to start in the first place. Great question, so let's see here. We did those two, I'm looking through some more here. Um, let's see here. Good idea. Blah, blah, blah. I got my man, Adam Barta. Shout out to Adam Barta for, uh, winning the, uh, the, um, Peterson. the Peterson classic here. Nice bowling as always, sir. Okay. Here, what we got? Would you recommend only putting a minimal amount of glue for inserts and putting in the front and back to work? Okay. So yeah, a couple things on that, right? Oh, well, first we got to go back over here. You can see now we're at ready for spot number four. We've got four spots that this ball is cracked. I mean, you can just see where we started the live stream and where it's at right now. It's moved that far in, in uh, I don't know, we've been on for maybe a half hour or so. Anyway, so back to, the, back to that question. Yes, minimal amount of glue. The more glue you put, the more you dry it out. The more you dry it out, the more prone it is to crack. Let's go ahead and get that flashlight back up here again. So minimal amount of glue. I am a big fan of putting the glue in the areas of here and here. Where you Not where the bridge is. Because once again, if you dry this bridge area out, which tends to be very thin, more likely to promote a crack. Um, I tell you what else I've been playing around with. There's, um, there's a type of, uh, uh, not cement, what's it called? Man, what's it called? It's uh, rubber cement, rubber cement. Rubber cement is less aggressive, it still holds the glue in, I mean, it still holds the grip in, it still does a great job of that, but it's less aggressive, it doesn't do this whole, here, this is perfect, it's dry now, perfect, perfect, get your flashlight over here, so check this out, so look, so the simple fact is, this area is now dry from the super glue that I put on here, and because of that, it has dried out all of this area, so this area is way more prone to crack now, because, remember I told you it was like a sponge, and remember when you push on a sponge, when you push on this, it actually brings some of that um, plasticizer to the surface. Well, now the plasticizer has been dried out in this area. There's nothing left, and the and the cover's harder here because of the way this is set into the ball. So now this is a very, very high prone area to crack. Very high prone area to crack. And the more that you put in the ball, the more it's prone to crack. Great, great, uh, great question. Here's something else you can do, right? If you if you if you really wanted to help stop this from being an issue, because it's only here that's gonna cause that problem. If you can glue down here and then put the grip in. Now you gotta use a slower glue for that, right? You gotta use a slower glue, because if you put it, you, if you do the fast glue and you do that, you won't be able to get the grip in. But use a slower curing glue, put the grip, put the glue down at the this layer, the, the outer core layer, you're less likely to dry it out. It doesn't have plasticizer in it to begin with, so you won't help to propagate that cracking that you're gonna have when you put it in this layer. Great question. Let me see what else we got. Man, I appreciate you guys jumping on here. Let's see here. So we answered that. Thank you, Chad. Let's see here. 
There we go. So Paul said, what do you put the what do you put the glue further down the cover? Yep. So exactly, that's a great point. I just got done saying that. So instead of putting the glue up here, you put the glue down in this area. You're less likely to help stop that cracking. Let's see here. I was wondering why my stuff up weird out here. Shout out to Eddie Bird. Keep my stuff on point. So there you go. So that is kind of that is that is just some information, man. And you guys are being able to see firsthand. Look, look, from number four, it's already past number four. Like that fast. So Mark says he puts a little bit of amount of glue at four and eight toward the bottom um, of the cover stock. Yeah, so that's the best part, right? So you want to get underneath this shell. You want to get underneath this shell and get it into the core because it's, it's, does that mean it's not going to crack? No, it doesn't mean that. But it's less likely to crack in here because there is no plasticizer than up here for sure. That's definitely a, a, a fact. Let's go check this one out over here. Oh, yeah. Number three is way past number three now. You can see that. Yep. So, I mean, you can see, I mean, and like I said, it will go all the way around. It'll go all the way around before it's done. Okay, so now back to the resurfacing question that we had. So, this ball back over here. What I would tell you is this. Can I have a pencil? So, when you're going to resurface your ball, what I would recommend you do is I would recommend that you, that you start by sanding with the grip side face up. So, we're going to start with this side face up. Here's kind of the trick. When you sand a bowling ball... Can you just give me any Avalon pad out there? I'm not gonna actually gonna sand it. I'm just gonna show them what it looks like. Um, when you sand the bowling ball, you put the most pressure this way when you're pressing down on the ball. When you get to the side of the ball, you can't put as much pressure laterally as you can up top to bottom. So because of that, in my opinion, it's very key that you make sure you cover enough sides of the ball to get all of it fairly even. What I like to do is if I was sanding this ball, which I'm not going to, but if I was sanding the ball, I would go 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, okay? So that would be the process that you would use for each of the sides I'm getting ready to show you. So that's one side. The next side you're going to do is you're going to flip the ball upside down, 180 degrees, upside down, and do the same thing right here. Same thing. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000. 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, okay? Now, flip it, back to the, flip it back to the grip, center grip, okay? Now, you're gonna rotate it 90 degrees. This way. Put an X there, same process. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000. Guess what? From here, 180 degrees. No problem, Mark, take it easy, man. have a good day. 180 degrees, X, same process, right? Now that's where most people stop. Here's the problem that I have with that. You don't, you're not being able to do even pressure because of the whole, you know, you can press harder here than you can here. So what I like to do then is I like to go back to the center of the grip, okay? Then what I do is I spin it down 90 degrees because this side right here, this part of the ball never got any downward pressure. So now I go right here, okay? Same thing. Now, 180 degrees from that, which means we're going to go this way. This is the last spot. So now what happens, you do this spot here, and now you've done what I call a six sides of a bowling ball. Now you're going to be able to get adequate pressure, adequate downforce pressure in an equal manner on the majority of the bowling ball. So essentially, it's six sides to do the whole ball. Okay? We'll just kind of show them with the X. So... You've got the center of grip. You've got one X on this side of the ball. One X on this side of the ball. Okay. You've got one X on the top. One X on the bottom. And one X on the back. So that's a sanding tip for you right there. That puts equal pressure on the bowling ball and we'll be able to cover it. In terms of how often you need to do your bowling ball, that's a function of what you're bowling on. I like to say, if you have your own spinner, I'm going to do my balls every 18 to 24 games, just to kind of depending on what service I have. I think if you use a 2,000 grit or higher, you can use you can you can use uh, 21, 18 to 24 games on a consistent basis. If you use a 1,000 grit or 500 grit, you got to do it way more often than that. You probably got to do it every six games, every three to six games. We actually have a surface scanner here that we actually uh, use to measure some grits. Maybe on another live stream, I'll, we'll do some videos with that too. We'll, br we'll bring the surface scanner out 
and will show you how quickly a ball can change from bowling. I can tell you it can change a lot in three games, um, depending on what grit you start at. So that's just a little bit of information right there. Let's see what else we got. So if a ball doesn't have to feel like a high road or a quantum, do you? Okay, so now here's a good question. So high roads, black quantums, um, both those balls are thick shell. You're not going to be able, obviously, to get to the white part of the ball in order to put the glue. Here's what's funny, though. Because the shell on those balls is thicker, the thicker the shell, the less prone it is to crack. And that, this, that's, that's common sense. So let's think about it for two seconds. If I have a, this is five eighths of an inch, I think, or half an inch thick. If I have a half an inch thick cover stock and I hit it with a hammer, I could probably crack it. If that cover stock was two inches thick, like a high road, and I hit it with a hammer, it's just gonna bounce, it ain't gonna crack. So the thicker the cover stock, the less likely you are to have this issue um, in general. Does that mean it won't crack? Does that mean high roads never will crack? No. Does that mean carms will never crack? No, but it is less prone to crack um, because of that. So how much did we charge to do a resurface? So our resurface um, practice starts out at $40, um, D. You come in, we do a full resurface on the ball. We actually have a machine. We use a machine that does it. So it helps keep the ball round. The cool thing about the machine is when you put your ball in here, it's gravity uh, pressure. So the pressure of the ball is even across all three pads and it keeps the ball round. So that's what we actually do and it's 40 bucks to get that done. So just, a, just, some, just some information for you guys. Uh, just some tips. Hopefully that helps you out. I wanted to be able to give you all some information and kind of help uh, grow the sport. Because I've been hanging out in the shop all week and doing what we do. And one last, we'll, we'll look one more, one more time. There it is. There's number five. So in this little bit of time that we've spent together, you've been able to watch this ball crack five different times. What about the other one? Oh yeah, it's it's spread a little bit too. So maybe what I'll do when we're all done, I'll take a picture tomorrow um, of the ball when it's probably all the way went all the way around by that point and you'll be able to see how it ended up but with that being said man i appreciate you guys for jumping on here and just kind of watching this little live stream i wanted to do something kind of educational for you guys i saw a lot of social media posts about crack it feel free to uh jump drop some more questions in here feel free to go to my uh facebook page and ask questions we're always looking for new staffers if you like bowling you want to get better at bowling it's this type of information that we typically drop in the staff group to our staffers you can learn more information about that at ctdbowling.com and then look for the tab that says join our staff with that being said ceo ron Huckley from creating the difference from brunswick river grove creating the difference bowling store number three with my man